Hi, I am Odisha Gautam. I am a software engineering manager on SQL tools and experiences team. Over the past couple of years, I have been working on DAGFX, SSDT, and Azure Data Studio, mostly focusing on database developer persona and scenarios related to it. Today, along with Drew, I will be demoing some of the database developer capabilities in Azure Data Studio and through extensions, which we have released over the past couple of months, and some of which we are still working on. Hope you enjoy our presentation and demos. Thanks, Yadisha. My name is Drew Squires Kabbalah. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a program manager at Microsoft. I work a lot on database developer experiences, including the SQL database projects extension for Azure Data Studio. I was a database developer prior to joining Microsoft, so taking a look at some of the really cool things that we can do for database developers, including bringing database projects to a cross-platform experience has been really exciting. When we kind of talk about database projects today, uh, we're going to start by taking a look at what project-based database development is uh, overall. At first, just kind of introduce the idea of why is working with projects different than what you would you know, do right-click script as in an object explorer? What, what sets that apart? Then we'll take a look at kind of the database project lifecycle in Azure Data Studio. What does it look to start a project from the beginning and take it all the way through the end? And we'll do that through a number of different demos. In the demos today, you'll see a UI for workspaces, which is at the time of this conference in Azure Data Studio Insiders, but it's not in the main Azure Data Studio. Projects are in Azure Data Studio, but they'll be under the File Explorer instead of the Workspaces UI, which will be coming very soon. But if you'd like to try it today, just grab Azure Data Studio Insiders. Before we wrap up, We'll take a look at some of the supporting extensions within Azure Data Studio. Many of them integrate directly into database projects and they kind of enrich the development experience, giving you this kind of full-fledged experience where you get to not only just write code, but deploy it and compare it to live databases. There's 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 a lot there's a lot to do. So without further ado, let's dig in. Let's dig into project-based database development. Now, project-based database development is not just a mouthful. It is the construct of being able to leverage a SQL project system to focus on declarative database development. Declarative database development gives us the ability to focus on a single desired end state as we develop and allow the tooling to manage any change in migration that would happen during deployment based on where our application is in its, its life cycle. So sometimes this is known as state-based development. And what it boils down to is that as you're writing code, as you're developing your database, you're using create statements, create table, for example. If the table already exists on the server that you're developing against, it would be the, the SQL project structure, that tooling that would manage writing an alter table statement for you in the background, handling all of that. Your focus is on that single desired end state that you want your database to look like for your application. In project-based database development, we've talked about the focus on that desired end state as you develop. The second stage of this uh, development cycle is the build process that happens where your project is compiled into a data tier application or a DAC pack. One of the fun pieces of functionality that's important to be aware of is that that compilation happens against a target database engine that's specified in the SQL project file. So for example, if you use objects that um, are available only in specific engine versions. Uh, let's talk about streaming objects for Azure SQL Edge. Your target database engine would have to be um, that kind of database engine. Um, another example would be uh, if you were developing for SQL Server 2016, you set that as your target database engine. If you had in your code functionality that wasn't added until SQL Server 2019, your build would then fail because of that disparity between the, the capabilities of those engines. So keeping in mind that that build process does take into account real, um, real concepts from database engines is, is important. But last but not least, and potentially the most exciting is, is the publish phase. The 
cool thing about the project-based database development cycle is that this publish phase leverages those data tier applications files, those DAC pack files. So if you build a project, you can deploy it once or you can deploy it many times. So it can be reused. It's, it's uh, kind of a portable format. One of the biggest draws towards project-based database development is really comes down to the version control ease that comes from having a, a project structure with a bunch of SQL files that are uniformly focused on create statements. This does not ignore, however, that there are real environments that you occasionally need to understand more about. And that's where schema compare comes in because it allows you to compare either the database project or multiple environments against each other. So you could have production, you could have test, you could have a database project, and you would be able to see the differences between them in terms of that declarative language. Now, before we start talking about some of the UI elements, I do want to step kind of down a layer into a command line tooling because I mentioned that SQL projects compile to deck packs and one of the most common ways that they are um, interacted with in production for that publish is going to be through the command line just due to the efficiencies that come from it. So it's great to be aware of SQL package, which is a command line tool that allows us to automate a lot of these operations. For deck packs for data tier applications. These are files that are really just a definition of the SQL Server objects, just the schema. There are backpack files that you may have heard of that have both the database schema and the data within them. But for purposes of database development, we're going to focus on DAC packs. Within the SQL package, there are extract operations and publish operations for DAC packs. Extract takes a database and brings it out into a DAC pack file. Publish takes a DAC pack and publishes it to a live database. What SQL package looks like in general is there's a there's a parameter for the action. So in, in this example, we would be using the action extract. And then there are additional parameters that you would need, like the server that you're interacting with or the target file for your output or in the opposite direction, the, the source file and then the target server. Sometimes when you see SQL package commands, um, I just wanted you to be aware that there are sometimes these short form parameters. So there's just kind of some synonyms going on there. But the whole reason why SQL package is important is because within the last year, year and a half, SQL package has become a fully cross-platform um, due to .NET Core. So SQL package can be run on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And that was also part of the road towards making SQL uh, database projects cross-platform as well. Before we talk more about database projects in Azure Data Studio today, I wanted to make sure that we're acknowledging that there are two different interfaces, uh, graphical interfaces for working with database projects. The first one is SQL Server Data Tools in Visual Studio uh, 2019. It's available on the data platform workload. So whether or not you're in Visual Studio community or enterprise, you can get to work with the, the SQL database project concept in Visual Studio on Windows. Now, in the world of Azure Data Studio, the SQL Database Projects extension gives us a whole lot of that functionality. We're going to go through it all today. And that um, leverages the .NET Core SDK to make this fully cross-platform for Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. Um, they can all work with SQL Database Projects in Azure Data Studio. And I think potentially the best news of all is that the work in Azure Data Studio, those database projects, are compatible with SQL Server data tools. So if you are currently working in Visual Studio and want to open those database projects in Azure Data Studio today, you can do that. You can start a project in Azure Data Studio today and collaborate with someone that's in Visual Studio um, and it'll continue to work. So there are, there are options there. But as we delve further today, we're going to talk a little bit more about Azure Data Studio and SQL database projects. Within Azure Data Studio, there are some foundational features that make it a really great development environment. And so I'm going to demo those real quick before we dive into the rest of the session on projects functionality.
The four things that I want to talk about is the embedded source control that brings access to Git repositories and the ability to collaborate right within the editor experience. The uh, Azure Resource Explorer, which means that as you're needing to work with different resources across your server estate, whether it's a database or an Azure SQL managed instance, you can kind of browse through those real easily. Um, Second to last is the built-in terminal. So whether it's a bash operation or a PowerShell that you need access to for uh, potentially some uh, automation, you've got that right there in the editor window as well. And then um, potentially one of the most overlooked items is the query editor snippets, which are a customizable way to create shortcuts for you to use while coding. So we're gonna pop right over into Azure Data Studio. In Azure Data Studio, uh, like I mentioned, we have the source control built in. So over here, we've got uh, the changes that have been made recently. We have a, a new file. So we're able to create a new branch for our deployment scripts. I can uh, add a commit message, stage my change and commit it all right from in the, the same editor experience that I had been coding in. Within the connections pane, not only do we have access to any servers that we've connected Azure Data Studio to, but there's also the Azure Resource Explorer. That means that you can browse through your Azure subscriptions to different SQL databases and other data platform resources. The built-in terminal can be accessed from the view menu to pop up the terminal from the bottom. And you can even create multiple terminals by hitting the plus sign. So if you've got one operation that you've started in one window and you need to do something else, um, there's, there's a lot of flexibility there for you. Closing that panel down gets you the rest of the space back again, so you're not having to be cluttered up if you don't want it. But like I mentioned, one of the overlooked items is the ability to use code snippets. Uh, for example, there are pivot statements, a uh, select statement where the rows and columns are flipped around. And it could be kind of hard to remember exactly how to write a pivot statement off the top of your head. And so you've kind of got a, an inner select, and then you're aggregating a certain column. If you use the command palette or control shift P, and search for snippets, you can configure user snippets for SQL. What this JSON file does is it allows you to define specific user snippets. This one's called pivot framework. And then the body of the text that it will insert into the editor for you. The curly brackets are tab stops or placeholders that your cursor goes to every single time you hit tab and it allows you to kind of pre-type in uh, different variables or whole whole expressions. So this snippet here is written to mirror the overall structure of a pivot select statement. So if I open up a new window and I start typing the name of this snippet pivot framework, it's going to give me the option to expand it out by hitting tab. And now my cursor is here blinking on that first tab stop, asking me to type in the, the name of the rows that I want from my base query. And as you hit tab again, as you start typing through things, it'll move for these tab stops. If uh, the tab stops have been defined to have the same number, you're gonna be typing in more than one place at one time. So you could potentially be saving yourself some time by being able to efficiently kind of create out that whole select statement. And again, this would be available in any SQL editor throughout Azure Data Studio, so you can reuse it again and again. That base snippet always remains available to you. So you don't have to memorize exactly what you need to do here, but you can kind of get the framework out to finish filling out as you work through it. So these are just some of the ways that Azure Data Studio can be a, a nice development environment to be working in. 
but we really want to get into the meat of what projects look like in Azure Data Studio. So you can create new or open existing projects. You can import a database into a project. You get to work with the objects, whether they're tables, stored procedures, any, any, any kind of schema object. You can add a database references, so you can reference between different uh, databases or different projects. So you kind of have a more than one dimensional project. You do not have to use command line tools like SQL package to publish your project. You can do that right from the UI within Azure Data Studio. And you can also define pre and post deployment scripts. So that would be uh, a classic example for inserting sample data after as a post deployment script for test environments. And then uh, not, not to be forgotten is also the schema compare integration for projects in Azure Data Studio with the ability to kind of see some of those changes that have happened. Now I've, I've done enough, uh, enough talking about database projects and we want to show you some stuff. So Wadisha is going to take it away with a, a great end-to-end -end example with database projects. Thanks, Drew. So as Drew was mentioning, we are trying to bring in more and more of database developer capabilities to cross-platform through Azure Data Studio. When we talk about database developer, projects become a key part of the conversation. So far, database projects were only available on Windows through SSDT in Visual Studio that many of you might already be aware of. And now we're trying to bring in more and more of those features into ADS through our SQL database projects extension. And in my demo today, I will try to walk through end-to-end -end lifecycle of a simple project and show what capabilities this extension provides. To give a gist, uh, using this extension, you can create a new database project. You can also open a database project that you created using SSDT previously. You can also create a project from a live database. And once you have created the project, it allows you to edit these projects, make changes, build these projects, and then incrementally deploy them onto same or different uh, servers or databases. So before we jump into the end-to-end -end demo, I wanted to quickly show that the database project extension is available in the extensions gallery, and you can simply search and then install the same uh, from the extensions gallery. Let's get started with the demo. Uh, as you can see, I have ADS opened here. And now you can see that we have capability for creating or opening open existing uh, database projects. So I go with the create new option first. I simply pick a project name. And a location. I like the repo location. And then when I click OK, the project will be created for me. Uh, here you might notice this uh, specific type of project, the SQL database uh, type of project. This is a new extensibility point that is added in ADS for more and more extensions to be able to plug in different type of projects into ADS. So continuing the demo, uh, let's create the database project. I click OK here. And ADS asks me uh, that behind the curtain, can it also create a workspace for me so that in future, when I create new projects, the projects will be added to the same workspace. And hence, I can uh, open all of these projects together or treat them as a single unit if I need. So I say create the workspace. So in a minute, it will create the workspace for me and add the project that I created to the workspace. So now that I have my project created, as you can see, this is a bare minimum project with no items added to it. I can start adding new items to it. For example, I can add a table. I can also add a view to it. And at this point, this project is self-sufficient. We can build this project, publish this project, and so on. Uh, but as I was mentioning before, the concept of dealing with multiple projects together is an important one. There are times when you have some of the objects in one project, you want to use it in the other project, and so on. 
So let's see how we can add more projects to the workspace. So I say open an existing project. It asks me if I want to open a project or a workspace. In my case, just a project. So I open an existing sample project to this uh, view and hence it gets added to the workspace. As you can see, this project is a edge specific, Azure SQL edge specific project, and it has objects around uh, streaming job input, streaming job output, uh, jobs, and some tables, and so on. Now, how do I do interop between these two projects? For example, if I want my view uh, to actually refer to the temperature management stable, measurement stable here, can I do that? Yes, all I need to do is add a database reference. Here, this dialog, this database reference dialog, allows user to add references to different projects, to system databases like master and so on, and also to pre-count DAC packs. In our case, we just want to add reference to the project, so we select the same. And since we only have one other project in our uh, workspace and in our view, only one item shows here. Then next thing it asks is when I want to deploy, will I be deploying these objects from these two different projects to different databases or to same databases? For simplicity, let's just pick same database here. And then I say add reference. Now you'll notice that a reference to the edge project is added from my demo project. And to use this, I can now use, say, this table in my view. Now, if I build and deploy these, project, uh, these two projects, I'm expecting that the build and deploy will happen for both of these. So I built the project, and you will notice that it tries to build both the projects. And once it has successfully built the projects, I can go ahead and try to publish them. To publish this, uh, these projects, I can just simply select a connection. Because my project has edge specific objects, I'm going to select the edge instance. I can all, also provide uh, different deployment options through a profile if I want to. In my case, because it's a simple project, I'm not going to do that. I can select the database name. It can be a pre-existing database or a new database. Here, I'm just using a new database, which is same name as my project name, which is the default. And then I publish the same. It will now build uh, both the DAC packs, both the projects, and try to publish them on the same database called My Demo Project. So once this deployment completes, we should be able to go to our connection and see this database in action. And here you see, my demo project is created. The tables from both the projects are present, the my table and temperature management me uh, measurements. The views are present, the data sources for edge and so on are also present. So this is an end-to-end, -end, very simple uh, life cycle of a project from creation to deployment. But when we are talking about developer scenarios, this is not enough of a life cycle. We also need to be able to incrementally change the project and hence the database. So let's see how we do that. First of all, to ensure that our project is version controlled or it can be collaborated and contributed to by multiple folks, let's see if we can check in this project. So here in Azure, you have a source control view where you can either use a pre-existing connection or if you don't have a connection, you can initialize a fresh repository. So I say initialize repository. Because I have these projects opened, it asks me by default if I want to initialize one of these or choose a different folder. Here, I will just choose my demo project. And this uh, 
initializes a source control and adds all of the files inside of demo project in the in the source control for for change management i can now either see changes in them stage them add them to ignore and so on and so forth so here i'm just going to stage and commit them for the first time and then we'll see from there as we make changes So now all of my files are checked in to get locally committed so far. We can also push them to a remote repository or continue with our further development. Now going back to my project, me or a colleague of mine wants to make new changes to my demo project. For example, say they want to add a new table. or make a change to view to use a, the new table and so on. Now that we have made these changes, not only we can deploy them incrementally to the database, to the same database that we used before, we can also see these changes as part of version control and see what changes were done to each of these different files. So where a new file was added, where a change was made, and so on. And same as version control, we can also deploy this to the same database and DACFX behind the curtain will take care of figuring out what are the incremental changes and deploy only those changes rather than fully deploying the database again. So here, if I say publish again, and choose the same connection with the same uh, database. And if we want to see what are the additional changes that will get deployed the second time, let's do a generate script to see a sneak peek of the changes that will actually get deployed. So similar to deploy, this will also uh, build a DAC pack and then try to show, uh, then try to create a script to, to show what changes will get deployed. All right, so here in the script, we can see that all of the changes that are getting deployed the second time are the new changes. For example, it is creating only the new table and it is altering the view to refer to this new table. So now that we are sure that it's going to deploy only the incremental changes and we are satisfied with this script, we can either directly run this script to make the changes or we can actually do the publish from here, selecting the same connections and then providing a publish command, which will create the DAC pack and do the publish for me. Now, once this publish is done, my hope is to be able to see the new changes in the database. So here we go and we refresh the same and we find the new table as well as I want to see if the view is created with the changes, which it is. And as along with that, I also wanted to make sure that all of my changes got checked in. So I do so by doing a second commit. So as you can see, this way we can keep on creating incremental changes both to the project as well as to the database using the uh, SQL database project extension. This overall concludes end-to-end uh, -end life cycle for a simple project. That's all for my demo. Thanks a lot. Back to Drew. That's quite the demo to go end-to-end -end for a database project in Azure Data Studio. A lot happened there. So just to recap, we enabled projects in Azure Data Studio by adding the database projects extension. 
a new project was created and after some objects were added, an additional project was added to the workspace. So not only are you working with projects in Azure Data Studio, but a workspace is actually used to contain multiple projects. When you're working with multiple projects, you can tie them together through a database reference, which means that when you build and or publish the project, both of them are built and or published. Now, uh, Yudisha also demonstrated the ability to tie the project into source control, making collaboration a lot easier and basically track tracking changes through that. So that end-to-end -end demo could have been done by multiple different people grabbing the project from source control at different times. After making additional changes to the projects, uh, she went to publish, but in that instance, she generated scripts that demonstrated the changes that would happen at the database level. Back to what we were talking about earlier, when we talk about declarative database development, allowing you to focus on that end statement and then allow the tools to manage what the migration strategy needs to be. There are a few items that I want to kind of revisit from that end-to-end -end demo or add, add, a, add a few more details. So the, the first one is going to be creating a project from a database. So if we go into if we go into Azure Data Studio, I have a workspace with the AdventureWorks uh, database and a, and a project here. But on my server, I have an additional database, so Wide World Importers. Instead of creating a new project and adding each object individually, I can right-click on that database and create project from database. It's going to ask me what I want to call the project. It's going to ask where I want to save this. This is a lot like working with creating a new project. It's going to ask the kind of structure that I want to bring those objects out into. So because um, in the background, DACFX is going to be pulling all these objects out of the database into scripts. It wants to know how I would prefer them to be organized. My preference is object type. Different people have their own flavors of that. And we're going to see this task run. And it takes just a few seconds. And now we have two projects in our workspace here. Now that's a really quick way to start with projects on your existing databases. So even if you don't have any projects open in Azure Data Studio and you want to start working with database projects today, um, grab the extension and in your Object Explorer, right click Create Project from Database and you're, you're ready to roll uh, from your current uh, server estate. Now, the other, the other piece that Udisha touched on that I wanted to make sure that we um, really make sure we cover is the concept of database references. Um, with database references, you scale from one project to uh, a database development experience where you're ref uh, adding references to additional projects, what we've seen in workspaces with multiple projects. You can make references to system databases. So potentially you have a dependency on the, the master database. Um, and then last but not least, the potential to reference a DAC pack file. Uh, so you have a project that's already been compiled and you want to refer to that. And it's, it's good to be mindful that when you have same database references, your projects will be built and published together by default. So in this instance here, where we have two projects in this uh, workspace, we don't have to refer to each other. But if we right click on Add Database Reference, it's going to ask what kind of reference I want to have. In this case, I'm going to add a system database reference. And we'll leave the master database selected. It's going to be a different database, but I'm going to do the same server. I'll leave that database name. And then this is going to be that example usage. And we can add the reference to that project. So you can kind of scale your projects by adding database references for these more complex scenarios where everything's not neatly self-contained in databases. I know that that's uh, a, a rarity that we, we cherish when that happens, but when things get messy, you'll want to be able to leverage database references. 
So the build and publish process was something that when I talked about it earlier, I really focused on how this was leveraging the .NET Core SDK and that's how it is cross-platform now in Azure Data Studio. When you install the database projects extension, uh, it has a dependency on the .NET Core SDK. So that would be something additional that you'll be prompted to install. It's a really quick install. In many cases, just the default installation gets you uh, up, up and running real quickly. But if you have a complex development environment, you're able to set a specific uh, variable or path to the .NET Core SDK. When you publish, we saw the two different options uh, in Yudisha's demo where she was able to deploy the changes directly to the target database, but then alternatively, you can generate those scripts to kind of see those changes. So if in our, um, if in our projects here, we decided we want to build the um, AdventureWorks SQL project, I right click build. And we're going to see the output here from the .NET Core SDK executing the build process. And if any errors occurred, we would be able to see them here in this output pane like we can here. I believe it is upset about the <laughs> can't find my pre-deployment script that was defined in my SQL project file. So we're gonna take a look at another piece of functionality here. You're able to edit the SQL proj file. So the error that it's giving me is it could not find a pre-deployment file that's defined here. Looks like I was working some examples earlier. I'm gonna remove that from my SQL proj file. I'm going to save. It's going to ask if I want to reload my database project. I'm going to say yes. And then I'm going to try this build again. We'll see the build process kick off down here in the output. So we were able to, to build this project. And then now we can publish and we'll be given the option to either generate script or publish if we were, uh, once we connect to a server. So I will say, I want to deploy to production because I'm feeling. So I can go ahead and generate scripts here. This is again, going to use this output pane here. We can keep an eye on it. It's actually kicking off the build again. And so we would be able to see and or alter the changes before we go through the actual publish and execute that script. So you, you can maintain quite a bit of control even if you are using that Azure Data Studio UI. Now that we've gone through a, a very broad picture of the capabilities of database projects in Azure Data Studio, concluding that end-to-end -end demo, as well as some deep dives into the functionality. We also want to take a look at the other extensions for Azure Data Studio that integrate directly into or work really nicely uh, adjacently with database projects. This is basically the, the supporting cast for your development experience. Um, and in a lot of cases really do enrich the experience of working with declarative database development and with database projects. The first thing that I want to talk about is the schema compare extension, which does integrate directly in with database projects. It gives us the ability to use the schema comparison between both database projects compiled to DAC packs as well as live databases. And then as we do this, we get to fine tune it through schema compare options. And then as we customize the schema compare, we're able to save those settings, the, the source and the target, as well as those options, and then reload it in again later. So you're able to continually um, continue to use that customized experience such that you become a little bit more efficient with schema compare. The more you use it, the easier it gets to be to have. So if we take a look at Azure Data Studio, this is the extension page for schema compare. So you would install this extension. 
Once it's installed in the projects pane, the way that you use schema compare with projects is by right clicking on a project and instead of hitting build or publish, you would use schema compare. This kicks a build of the project off such that you have the most up to date DAC pack to use. And then the resulting schema compare uses the DAC pack as your source. So the, the, the source item here is a DAC pack from a project. The target is at your discretion, whether you want to compare to a DAC pack from another project, or if you want to compare against another database. So in this case, I can compare against a database on, on a server. So I'm going to be able to see the difference between a project and a live database. I'm going to go ahead and start that comparison real quick. But we've got a few other options up here at the top. There's the save of the schema compare file, and then um, if you're not in the middle of comparison, you can open one. And this allows you to save out the settings that we've set in terms of the source and the target, and then as well as some other options for exclusion and um, uh, the, the elements that you're ignoring from the schema. Schema compare has a very familiar interface if you're used to diffs in source control. So we can see for the regular user table a column for hometown has been removed. Now, if I wanted to script these changes out to the target, I would be able to generate script or I can apply them directly. You can also quickly switch the direction of the schema compare. But schema compare gets to be very powerful even as your scenario expands. So if I've got a bunch of differences or if I've got more complex objects, maybe you have uh, permissions on your database that you're not wanting to deal with. In the schema compare options, there's, there's quite a few items here and some of them can be a little more involved. So as you select the row, you get more information down at the bottom. If I scroll all the way down to ignore permissions, if I check that box, then it'll allow me to no longer um, include permissions in that schema comparison. Hit OK, and it's going to ask me if I would want to recompare to get that comparison. We're not going to continue through that, but you kind of get an idea of how schema compare can be used to see how a live database has changed over time, as well as how a project has changed different from either another project or a database. And it's not just a, an immediate action thing, but you can generate the scripts out to see how that would be applied. So now we're going to uh, have Udisha tell us a little bit about the data tier application wizard and some other ways that DAC pack files can be leveraged for other, um, other development activities with Azure Data Studio. So in this demo today, I'll be talking about the DAC pack extension, which was the first of the three to get released. Before I jump into the demo, let me give a quick brief of what the DAC pack extension is or what it does. So the DAC pack extension is built on top of the .NET Core version of DACFX APIs, and it provides similar functionalities to that of SQL package, which is a command line tool supported by uh, DACFX. And these operations are export, import, deploy, or extract of a database. So uh, first of all, let's see how to uh, get access to this extension. So to get this extension, all you need to do is go to the extensions view and type DAC pack. And that way you can get this extension installed from the gallery. Once you have the extension installed, you can go to your servers view and connect to any server of your choice. The DAC pack extension will work against any server that is supported by DACFX layer, which is any of the on-prem servers, as well as any of the Azure servers, including Azure SQL Edge. So here I have some databases on my uh, localhost server that I'm going to use for this demo. And to use this extension, all I need to do is right click and choose the data tier application wizard option. Here you'll see that we can perform these four operations against the selected database. I'll, to, I'll take a quick pause here and explain what each of these are in, in short. 
So the first operation, the deploy operation, is when you have a DAC pack, which is the model or the schema of a database, and you're trying to deploy it to a live database. It can be a pre-existing database that you're trying to update or a new database that you're trying to create. The second option is extract. Extract is when you have a live database and you want to take the schema out of that database and store it in a file so that you can deploy it to different databases. The third option here is import. That is, I have a backpack file through which I want to create a database, a live database. And here, when we say importing a backpack, it means that we are bringing in not only the schema, but also the data of, uh, of a backpack into the database. And finally, export. Export is the reverse operation of import. That is, from a live database, we are trying to get the schema plus the data into a backpack file for future usage. So these are the four options available through this extension. And let's get started with, the, with one of them. And for a quick uh, round trip here, I will try to show you the extract from a database to a DACPAC file, and then again from the DACPAC file, a deployment to the database. So let's go with extract. The information Extract asks us is what is the source server and source database? What is the version that I want to use in my DAC pack so I can actually version manage it and keep increasing version as I take more snapshots in future? For now, I'm just going to let it be 1.0.0.0. The final option is what is the location where I want to store my DAC pack? Once I have all of these, it gives me a quick summary, and then it starts an extract process for me. Once this extract process completes, I will have a DAC pack, which will be similar to any DAC pack created through either SSDT or SQL package.exe through command line. Now, once I have this DAC pack, what I can then choose to do is, again, using the same UI, I can deploy this DAC pack. To deploy the DAC pack, I first choose the file location, which is this. I then choose my target server. And I can also choose if I want to upgrade an existing database or create a new database. In my scenario, I'll just showing creating a new database first. When I say next, it shows me a quick summary. And then finally, it deploys the database for me. So once this completes, I should be able to see not only a new database, but a new database with the whole schema of wide word importers in it. All right, so now that we have the deploy operation succeeded, I refresh the list and I find the new database created with all the tables, views, and so on. What I can additionally do is every time there are changes in my source database, I can create DAC packs out of it and then deploy those DAC packs to my target database in an incremental fashion so that only the delta or the changes are then deployed to the target database and not the full uh, database schema again and again. Let's see how that works. So in my source database, suppose there is a change which adds a new table. I run this and there is a table created for me. Now I need to make sure that this change actually reaches my target database. For that, I do the following. I try to create another DAC pack Note that this is a separate DAC pack. It automatically picks up the timestamp, so you do not need to worry about giving it a new name every time. I 
I extract this and then I try to deploy this DAC back to my target server, which already has everything that was previously created on the database. So this time, along with choosing the newly created file, I say upgrade the existing database and I pick the database that was created in the previous operation. This will do an extra step of reviewing the deployment plan and figuring out if there is any change that I'm making which could possibly result into a data loss. It will then uh, iterate out the steps for me and tell me whether or not there is a possible data loss through this deployment. Because we just created a new table, there is of course no data loss. And then I can just either generate the script or deploy the database uh, correct, uh, directly. What this deployment will now do is, as you can see, it is pretty fast because now what it is doing is it is only deploying the delta to this target database. And once I refresh the tables, I should be able to see the new table here as well. So this is how the extract and deploy flow works for any database through DAC pack extension. We can also similarly do import and export using the DAC pack extension, which will bring not only the data, not only the schema, but schema plus data. Thank you. That was the end of this demo. Back to Drew. Another element of Azure Data Studio that can be very important to your database project's experience is notebooks. Now, I know it's hard to work with Azure Data Studio and not have heard about notebooks, but I want to kind of propose some different ways that notebooks can be used that fit very nicely in with database development practices. The, the first is the ability for a notebook to be kind of more dynamic in that you can create a full-blown Jupyter book that has Markdown integrated with um, code cells as well as uh, chapter structure in this, especially when you have larger projects or you have extended specifications. These can be really helpful for capturing that. And because notebooks can be a part of your repository, then you have source control on your specifications and some uh, tracking to that. The second uh, idea for notebooks that I want to propose and that we'll dig into an example here in a minute is using a notebook and the code cells in that to run and uh, create uh, T-SQL unit tests. And in many cases, they're more of just smell tests of, is this code executing as I expect in a, a test environment or even in a production environment, if that's the case. And then last, last but not least, uh, we had an example earlier where it was the Wide World Importers data warehouse. And in some cases, you will have some data cleaning that needs to be done um, after a deployment or any other post-deployment actions, and you can put those together in a notebook. And again, going back to the, the documentation nature of notebooks, being able to leave notes along with the code itself and beyond just comments, but uh, full-blown text cells really gives you some greater flexibility with that. So notebooks as a concept to give you kind of some more uh, freedom and creativity for your development practices. We'll take a look in Azure Data Studio. We're in the workspace pane. We have our two projects and the AdventureWorks database in the stored procedures. There's a USP new customer stored procedure that inserts a row into the customer table and returns the identity. Now, once this has been deployed into our test environment, we want to make sure that it's interacting as we expect when we give it some test data. One way we can do that is from the files, adding a new file to AdventureWorks, and we'll just call it our new customer test notebook. Now this is part of the folder, so it is source controlled. You saw I just added it up here, and so now it's ready to be grabbed into source control. But we're going we're gonna to make this notebook do something. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and attach it to my test environment. The, the first cell that I'm going to create here is just going to have it use AdventureWorks to make sure I'm pointed at the right database. 
And then in the next cell, I'm going to have it run that stored procedure that I want to test. So it's just going to throw in fictitious customer information, and we're going to see what comes out. Now, if we know what we expect to come out, we want to go ahead and note that. So I'm going to add a text cell that says the previous query should return a single row for the fictitious customer. Now we can save that with Control S, just like any other file. And now we have this, this notebook. So I'm going to close it out. When we reopen it, we have those two code cells and then the text cells. So I know what I should be expecting when I run this notebook. I should be expecting a single row. I'm going to run all after I connect it to the test environment. And it returned a single row. This is what I should be expecting. One of the uh, really powerful things about the code cells in notebooks is not just that it's kind of this organized executable environment, but that we can save this data here. So if I'm going to come back and run this again later, I can compare it against what I expect. So I'm going to go ahead and save this notebook again. It's been saved. When I close it this time, and then I, when I reopen it, this results pane will still be there. So I can see the results that I would have been expecting. And this can become a part of our source control um, and something that kind of works within the project process. So it's another, another nice thing to have in your toolbox in Azure Data Studio to supplement that development process with database projects. Now, really quickly, um, sometimes when you're working in test environments, um, you can have different data loading pipelines. Um, but in some cases, you may find that you just want to be able to import a flat file real easily. There is an extension for that. There is an import wizard that allows you to grab um, CSV files or even fixed width files. That is an extension that has recently gone to general availability. And this is based on the uh, pros SDK that allows it to kind of detect the data types in your flat file, which makes that data import pretty quick. So if you have a test environment where you want to grab data into it after you've deployed your project, uh, this import extension might be very helpful. I want to thank everybody for, for joining us today. We really appreciate you coming in, in, into this session and, and learning more about database projects in Azure Data Studio. Just from a really high level, taking a look at what we've got in that database projects experience is when you have a project, you can be creating new ones, you can open existing. There is that compatibility with SSDT, SQL Server Data Tools projects. When you're creating a new project, you can import from an existing database. So get started with the application you have already today. As you're editing the project, the interface is going to allow you to use the, the query editor within Azure Data Studio, and that includes code snippets. So you've got that um, really nice, quick developer environment to be working in. When you build the project, it's going to be checking the, the syntax as well as for functionality against specific database engines. And then finally, you can publish that project one or many times, either from the Azure Data Studio projects interface through some different deployment interfaces in Azure Data Studio, and then in potentially through um, DevOps pipelines and other automation. So as you see kind of that whole big picture of database projects, I hope that a, it's not overwhelming, and B, you can see how some of your application development can fit into a database project so that you can leverage this more easily source control environment to manage your database development. That's all we have for you in this session here today. Before we start taking your questions, I did want to recommend a few sessions to you. The examples that we did today, a couple of them came from some Azure SQL Edge concepts. And if you're interested in learning more about the Azure SQL Edge engine, I highly recommend the real-time data analysis using Azure SQL Edge session. There are two sessions on DevOps here. Um, 
when you're talking about database development concepts so quickly, does it bleed over into CI, CD, automation, DevOps concepts? And so I know that if you took something away from the session here today, um, you'd absolutely be taking something away from DevOps for Azure SQL or implementing SQL Server DevOps using Azure DevOps. Now, if you're uh, interested in learning more about Azure Data Studio or some of the other tools for the Microsoft Data Platform. Um, there are a couple sessions specifically on Azure Data Studio, Azure Data Studio Above and Beyond, the Azure Data Studio Notebooks Power Hour, and how to become an Azure Data Studio contributor. The Azure Data Studio contributor session is going to talk more about the open source concept behind Azure Data Studio and different ways that you can kind of participate in the community around Azure Data Studio. And so if you saw something today and you want to implement it uh, further or you're interested in seeing the product evolve more, there are ways to be uh, even, even more engaged and kind of uh, help us shape the, the product moving forward. The State of the SQL Tools session is going to take you through a whole lot of the tools, not just Azure Data Studio. So if you're interested in getting a real big picture on that, I highly recommend that session. So this is a thank you one more time for bearing with us today. The uh, documentation for SQL projects in Azure Data Studio is available at aka.ms and slash Azure Data Studio dash SQL projects. That'll get you to all the documentation, information on how to install it. If you have feedback on the product that you would like to share with us, we would love to hear it. The GitHub uh, Azure Data Studio repository, you're, you're more than welcome to open a new issue there, whether it's a feature request or a bug report, please do uh, communicate with us. And if you're interested in just emailing me directly, my email is here on the screen. So please do contact us if you have uh, any feedback. I do have to thank uh, Microsoft for us being a sponsor of the Data Platform Summit and the other community initiatives around the conference, as well as I wanted to let you know that there are three ways that you can win prizes. So uh, if you post a selfie with the hashtag or, and then follow them on Twitter, you are entered to win prizes. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you.